My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story, Lo, the Gentle Earthworm. You take a beautiful woman, a tall, bony-faced guy with a drawl, 724 million worms, mix them together, and you come up with a case of port wine. I did, anyhow. The thing took off under jet propulsion of a fatal Thursday. I made the mistake of reporting for work as usual at the Lion Detective Bureau office. So then you're Mr. Regan, the lion's eye. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, Jessie, this is Mirabelle Drake, Miss Mercantile Development of 1948. As I've been telling Mr. Lyon, I won the title over 400 aspirants, Mr. Regan. And for a $5,000 prize, Mr. Regan, in merchandise, of course. Huh. Congratulations. Uh, Mrs. Drake has a serious problem, Jeffrey. Yes. It's my husband. He's going to kill himself. Yeah, and with such a lovely wife, too. Isn't it a pity, Jeffrey? Your husband happened to mention what's bothering him? The worms. Worms? 724 million of them. Oh, makes it clearer. Mr. Regan, in just 18 days, it'll be the first of the month again. So? And there'll be one billion four hundred and forty-six million five hundred thousand worms. You see, Jeffrey, this is a serious matter. Sounds like. You must help me, Miss Regan. You must find the man who swindled my husband. He did swindle him. We know that now. You must catch Mr. Myron Biloxi and get our money back. Or my husband will kill himself. He will. I know he will. <laughs> went on like that for a couple of minutes. Then it began to get confusing. Arthur Drake, Mirabelle's husband, had bought 500,000 worms 12 months ago from Myron Biloxi. The worms had cost 5,000 bucks. Mirabelle's prize winnings converted to cash. They'd started a worm farm. The algebra of the multiplication of worms began to get out of hand the way Mirabelle told it, so I said maybe we better get out to her place and get the dope straight from the worm grower's mouth. She said, Okay. The Drake place was on the El Segundo Flats, between L.A. and the ocean. Rancho Gusano in the Spanish. Worm ranch, that meant. Clapboard house, tin mailbox, gasoline cans and orange crates lying around the yard. I thought of a beautiful kid like Mirabelle Drake living in a place like that. Oh. And then all of a sudden I was thinking of something else. Oh, my heavens, Arthur shot himself! Come on, baby, those shots came from out the back of the house. I ran around to the back of the tumble-down house. Mirabelle Drake, 15 seconds from back of me. Yeah, but Arthur Drake hadn't shot himself. There was a third shot just as I rounded the corner of the house, and I saw a tall, gaunt guy in overalls. He had an old-fashioned Springfield rifle in his hands, and when he saw me, he shouldered it. Stop now, you! Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's all right, I... This is Mr. Regan, the lion's eye, just going to help us. Oh, well, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Regan. I'm sorry. Arthur, I... I forget it. Arthur, what are you doing with the gun? Well, now, I got to thinking we're pretty isolated out here, Mirabelle. What are we to protect? Nothing. There's nothing here except these worms. Oh, now there, honey, don't you take on. I got you to protect. Is that the real reason you bought the gun, Arthur? From the look on the sunburned, raw-boned face, that wasn't the real reason Arthur Drake had bought the Springfield rifle. He and Mirabelle looked at each other a minute, and then Mirabelle sobbed once, <laughs> smothered it, and turned and ran into the house. Hmm. I reckon she's kind of upset, Mr. Regan. Yeah, it seems to be. Well, I'll just set this here gun aside. See that there can over there? I just said you how to work. And now I'd like to show you around my place. Sure, I'd like to see. Well, this way. Okay. It ain't pretty, Mr. Regan. I guess I'm what the psychologist at the university back home in Arkansas used to call failure prone. I've lost my wife's beauty prize money on these worms. That's what changed me. This, uh, worm raising sounded a little complicated the way Mirabelle explained it to me. Oh, but it ain't. Now, I'll show you. Now, here's the vegetable lug boxes I raise them in, Mr. Regan. Hmm. Under the gunny sack? Yeah, that's correct. Stacks of lug boxes. And then all you need is the cans of water and the tub of acid. Boxes, water, acid. 
Mm-hmm. No, Mr. Regan, I can't agree with Mirabelle that the breeding of worms is exactly complicated. For the $5,000 I gave Mr. Myron Biloxi a year ago, I got me 500,000 worms. 5,000 bucks, 500,000 worms. Yeah, it cost me one cent a worm. That adds. Well, worms is valuable. They enrich the soil. People buy them for their gardens, Miss Regan. Yeah, I heard. Now, uh, 500,000 worms produce 1,500,000 egg capsules at the end of the first month. Well, don't stop now. Well, the egg capsules mature in three months, Miss Regan, and each capsule produces round about 1 to 20 worms. So allowing for fatalities to the young... You begin to harvest two and a half million worms a month after the fourth month. Like you said, not complicated. Of course, in the eighth month, the first harvest of two and a half million worms has produced 15 million young'uns. And the next month, with the first 500,000 worms and the first and second harvest of two and a half million worms all producing concurrently, you get yourself 27,500,000 worms around the then after that, the figures begin to get big. Oh, yeah, they do, Mr. Reagan. Huh? And every one of those worms is worth one cent? Yeah, that's so. Well, it's come to a decent profit in a year's time. Well, deducting one-sixth of the growth for cost and six and a quarter million dollars on a $5,000 investment in one year. Oh, that sounds fair enough. That's what I thought when Mr. Myron Biloxi explained it to me and sold me the worms. He guaranteed me a thousand percent profit or money back. But now I've got me 724 million head of worms here on my rank, Mr. Regan. And I can't sell them. Market won't absorb that much. And I can't locate Mr. Myron Biloxi to get that there money back. That's why I begin to think that Mr. Biloxi swindled me. You know, Drake, I think you may be right. <laughs> The first step in putting the bee on the worm king, Myron Biloxi, was to find him. Maybe that wouldn't be easy. Down to the worm deal, he was slick, mean. Mirabelle Drake and her husband couldn't help me much, just a description. Myron Biloxi had seemed prosperous, was about 60, kindly, round faced. I got 10 bucks from Arthur Drake against expenses, and he had to go down deep for that. Then I drove back downtown to the Lion Detective Bureau office. Lion had news for me. Oh, here you are, Jeffrey. I'm glad to see you. What's up, Lion? The Mirabelle Drake just telephoned. Oh, yeah? What's wrong? I just left there. Oh, she was terribly upset, Jeffrey. Nearly hysterical. Her husband's disappeared. I told the Lion to check the regular channels, missing persons, Bunko squad files, try to get a line on the guy whose real name might or might not be Myron Biloxi. Then I got out to Rancho Guasano fast. Like the lion said, Mirabelle was nearly hysterical. I had to let her cry off the first wave of tears before she was calm enough to make sense. <laughs> Listen, lady, the faster you give me what happened, the faster I get started to find your husband. Yes. Yes, of course, that's true. How long has he been gone? Well, I'm not quite sure. You see, I, I lay down in the bed. You fell asleep? Yes. And when you woke up, he was gone? Yes, yes, Mr. Regan. Well, maybe he had to go somewhere. Or get some supplies for his worms, maybe. No, no, no. Sure? Oh, yes. You see, he didn't take the car. It's a three or four mile walk to any place at all from here. That's how I know, Mr. Wiggin. He's walked off into the hills to kill himself. Just <laughs> try to relax, Mirabelle. I'll look around the place and see if I can turn up a lead. I walked out back of the house. No sign of art. I started poking around the lug boxes the worms were kept in and was just pulling some of the gunny sack coverings off when Mirabelle came out. Have you found anything that'll help, Miss Regan? No, not yet. You better wait in the house, lady. Oh, no, no, I can't. I can't. But... Okay, okay. Regan, you're looking for Arthur's rifle, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Look, Mirabelle, um... Uh, Come on and get busy. Help me uncover these stacks of lug boxes. We may find something. All right. Uh, start on that section over there, huh? All right. Just pull off the gunny sack? Yeah, check down between the boxes. The rifle could be there. Yes, I do. Uh, no, never mind. I found it. What? Oh, Mr. Regan! Then Arthur... No, your husband hasn't gone off someplace to shoot himself. That's right. Oh, thank heaven. Here's the rifle. Down here, back of these boxes. But then, if Arthur didn't go off to shoot himself... What? what I'm wondering myself. Why did he disappear? 
Hey. Hmm? The thing you started to uncover over there. That's not a vegetable lug box. Oh, yes. It is. Some of the gun is back in like the other. Sure, but, but look. Hmm. Not the same shape. No. It's round. On the surface, under the sacking, the top surface of these lug boxes is flat, flat, wormy earth, straight across from edge to edge. But that gun you said, bumpy. Something bumpy surfaced under it. Yes, there must be. Stay here. No, no, Stay I... here. Now, let's see. Hmm. So that's it. What is it, Mr. Regan? It's all right. Come on. What is it? This. A case of wine. That surprise you? Oh, well, yes. Yes, it does. Well, the bottle made the bumps on the gunny sacking. And this against the case of wine, just some sacking. I could give the thing the shape of... Of a covered up body. Might have been that. Have a look at one of these bottles. They look pretty old. But I can't understand Arthur spending money on wine. Now when we have so little. No, I'm no expert, but it figures this wine cost dough. Look, here's the label. Robertson Special Vintage Port. Bottled at Villa Nova de Gaia, Portugal, in the year 1892. Well, the others are the same 12 bottles. One case of port wine. 58-year-old vintage port. Mr. Regan, I remember enough from when we had money and, and Arthur used to buy wine. You know that that must be terribly expensive. So maybe somebody gave it to him. Maybe we can find out who. In the Anthony J. Lyon Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon Esquire speaking. Okay, Yuski, you can stop staring at the petty girls and get to work. Well, I don't know what you mean. This is Regan. I know that. You think I wouldn't recognize your voice after all these years, my boy? What kind of a detective do you think I am? Skip that. Jeffrey! Did you locate Myron Biloxi, Lion? Uh, no, no, there's not a trace of him anywhere. Police files, telephone... Okay, company. listen, Lion, two things. First, phone Lieutenant Sanducci at the homicide department. No, don't tell me there's been a murder. Well, it's not that. I, I want Sanducci to do something, unofficially. Oh, I see, a uh, favor. Ask him to get to the right guy in the highway patrol division and have a couple of squad cars from the El Segundo Playa del Rey region start combing the section from around uh, uh, Century Boulevard, south. Then Arthur Drake really is missing. Well, it begins to look that way. He's tall, lean-faced, about 35. Now, if they find him, uh, they can ride him to a substation on some pretext and phone me. Now, the other thing, Lion. Yes, Jeffrey? Start phoning wine merchants. Find out all you can about Robertson's Port Wine, vintage of 1892. Jeffrey, to be thinking of such a thing with that poor... Miss Mirabel's crying her heart out. All right, don't drown in her tears. I'll explain the whole thing to you in 40 minutes. I'm starting back to the office now. So, Lion, the best lead we've got to go on so far is that case of port wine. Now, if it cost enough and was bought anywhere around L.A., the wine merchant who sold it ought to remember. That could help. Yes, yes, I see that. Well, have you got anything on it yet? Well, uh, vintage port wine is expensive. Very expensive. That helps. It happens, Jeffrey, that there's a wine merchant in Beverly Hills who specializes in fine wines of that sort. I, uh, I've located him, Jeffrey. <laughs> He'll be returning my telephone call any minute. Okay, Pat, so good work. Uh... You got in touch with Sanducci? Well, naturally I did, Jeffrey. You take it, fix it, so uh, some cops will put the search on Arthur Drake? Yeah. Well, then we're rolling. I got it. That'll be your Beverly Hills wine guy calling back. Hello, Lion Detective. Regan talking. Sure, go ahead. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. You well, my boy? Was he able to help you? Wasn't the wine guy, the cops. One of the squad cars Sanducci had look around the El Segundo area stopped at Rancho Gusano. Start the Drake's place. They found Drake. But that's good, Jeffrey. Uh-uh. They found him bent double and shoved into the vat of acid he kept out in the back of his house. Dead lion. Murdered.
I got back out to Rancho Grosano fast after the phone call came from the cops that my client Mirabel Drake's husband had been found in a vat of acid out there, murdered. But I didn't get there before Lieutenant Sanducci of the L.A. Homicide Department. Reagan, Mrs. Drake tells me she's a client of yours. That checks with the phone call from Anthony Lyon that sent the boys out here. Well, Mrs. Drake hired me to find a guy named Myron Biloxi, Sanducci. Oh, yes. I feel he's responsible for all this somehow. He must be. Somehow. What about this Biloxi? Well, he swindled Drake. Got him to start this worm farm. Took five grand off him. You located Biloxi yet? No. Hmm. Well, it looks like a pretty clear thing here, Regan. By Mrs. Drake's own story. Her husband was shot. Shot? Shot, Regan. I just can't see how he could have been shot, Mr. Regan. As I, I told you, I'd fallen asleep. But I'm a light sleeper. And if anyone had fired a shot, I'm sure I would have heard it. That's a damaging admission, Mrs. Drake. It may be. But it's the truth. The deceased was shot with an old Springfield, Regan. Arthur's gun. The rifle you and I found down behind the lug box was an hour and a half ago, Mr. Regan. You, uh, you sure the Springfield did the job, Sanducci? The bullet entered the heart and lodged in the left ventricle. The body's not a pleasant thing after being in that acid, Regan. And it just happened that the blast was close enough to the... All right, take it easy, the... Sanducci. I get the picture. Yeah. Well, I'm not a tougher cop than I have to be, Regan. Sure, sure, I know. Anyway, we got the bullet. It was an old-timer. Chances are 999 to 1,000 that it was fired by the Springfield. Yeah, sure. Mrs. Drake seems to think her husband committed suicide. Yes, I do. She talked about being afraid he would when she came to the office to hire me. But that wouldn't account for her not hearing the shot. And even if it would, I would find it hard to believe a man could bend himself double and shove himself down into a vat of acid with a bullet lodged in the left ventricle of his heart. See what you mean. Well, Mrs. Drake... I haven't any choice except to hold you on suspicion of murder. <gasps> Sanducci took her off to headquarters. I drove to the nearest phone. Till Mirabel Drake was proved guilty, she was still my client. Inspector, 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 Spirit, Inspector speaking. This is the Lion Detective Bureau. Oh, yes, about that vintage. I've been meaning to return your call, but we've been simply suffused with custom. Yeah, uh, I wonder if you've got anything uh, on Robertson, me. Robertson, special vintage port, 1892, is most rare, sir. Uh, most rare. But it does happen that we sold a case of it a few months ago, and naturally we have a record of the sale of a collector's item like that. You happen to sell it to a guy named Myron Belasi? To English woman. Uh, the English means port. Not to starboard? What? Skip it. Listen. I have I... the record of the transaction before me now. One case, Robertson's Port, vintage 1892, at 900... Oh, sorry, W. can't divulge that information. How about the name and address of the buyer? Uh, Mrs. Diana Parker, 1 Royal Road, Bel Air. Thanks. I phoned the lion, told him to call the Agricultural Extension Service, told him to get all he could on worms and every piece of equipment needed for the care and raising. Then I drove out to Bel Air. One Royal Road was a king-sized cottage of 40 rooms. Tile, terracotta, palms, swimming pool off to the right, Great Dane chained on the left. There was Lincoln Continental parked in the drive, Mississippi license. I got a cute idea. They got a town in Mississippi named Biloxi. Now, if a guy takes on a phony name for some reason, he gets the idea of what phony name to use from some place. Hmm? Doorbell was the tongue of a devil. And when you pulled the tongue, the eyes lit up red. What answer the door would have made anybody's eyes light up. How do you do it? She was the only woman I'd ever seen who would have beaten Mirabelle Drake in a beauty contest. Red hair, clean, clear skin. A little haughty, maybe. May I ask who's called? Well, Regan's the name. Mrs. Biloxi. Step inside, please. Thanks. This way. Sure. I was about to have tea. Won't you join me? Lonely, you know, tea by oneself. By oneself with two cups? Oh, there are two cups. I was expecting someone. Oh, your husband, maybe. Oh, no, he's out of town. Sure he is. Do sit down, Mr. Regan. Thanks. May I pour you tea? Be better iced. 
Big fire you got down at the other end of the room? Yes. The day seemed quite chilly. Not to me, Mrs. Balaki. How odd of you to persist in calling me that. You know that I am Mrs. Diana Parker. Oh, I think that's your real name. I'll pour you tea. It's really rather good tea, you know. We English are partial to tea. Like you are to port wine? Yes. As we are to port wine. Your tea, Mr. Regan. Thanks. Oh, uh, if you'll excuse me a moment. Diana got up from the tea table and left the room in a hurry. Her mask dropped just for a second as she stood up. Then you could see she was scared, worried. I went to the window, looked out. The Lincoln Continental with the Mississippi license was still on the drive. The big Great Dane was tugging at his chain, barking. That was all. I figured I had another 40, 50 seconds. I wanted to know about that fire in the grate on a hot day. So that's it. Burning letters. There was a packet of letters in the fire. I raked it out. One of the middle letters hadn't burned yet. It was a love letter to Diana in a man's handwriting. I read the signature, brushed the ash off the letter, and stuck the letter in my pocket. I checked the window again. Diana was out in front trying to quiet the Great Dane. I kept an eye on her from behind a drape and picked up a telephone, dialed the lion. The lion Detective Bureau, Anthony J. Lyon. Lion, this has got to be quick. Yes, Jeffrey. Did you get that stuff I asked you to from the Agricultural Extension people about raising and taking care of worms? Uh, yes, Jeffrey, the most amazing thing. Did you realize that just a few hundred worms can produce simply... Later, million... Lion. What did they give you on the equipment for raising worms? Yeah, but that's one of the most beautiful things about it, Jeffrey. It requires almost nothing. Lug boxes, a few gunny sacks, and water. You sure that's all? Positively, the man assured me. Okay, Lion. Thanks. <laughs> There now, Mr. Regan, I must apologize for having been so long. Don't. Don't. It helps. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't you, understand. You, uh, seen the afternoon papers? No, but I have heard the wireless. About those flying saucers, you mean? I mean about Arthur Drake, the worm grower, getting murdered. Uh, Arthur Drake? Cut it, you know him. Your husband going under the name of Myron Biloxi took him for 5,000 bucks, sold him worms. Can you conceive, Mr. Regan, that I might not know all my husband's business? Sure, but you knew Arthur Drake. Probably met him through the worm deal. That doesn't matter. You met him. Maybe it was the old story, opposites attract. Anyhow, you and Arthur Drake fell in love. That's absurd. You gave him a present, expensive. Robertson's Port Wine, 1892 vintage. You bought it at Spectre, 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 Inspector in Beverly Hills. That case of wine's at Drake's house now. That's the kind of evidence that'll stand up in court. Very well. I knew Arthur Drake. What of it? Yes. This letter I saved from the fire is a love letter from Drake to you. Let me have that. Uh Uh-uh, evidence, baby. You know, uh, if your husband had happened to find a letter like this, could have made him pretty sore at Drake. Are you inferring my husband murdered Arthur Drake? Oh, I didn't say that. I told you that my husband's out of town. He's been away since yesterday, and Arthur Drake was alive this morning. That's right. He was. Now it's my turn. Excuse me a minute. Where are you going? There's somebody else in this house, and I'd like to talk to him. Sit still. Listen, oh, baby. Shoot. You're not very good at this game. <laughs> I dove across the tea table, got half a cup of tea in my lap, but I got Diana's gun. Then I took off to the other part of the house where I knew I'd find somebody hiding. Ten seconds later, I pulled up beside a heavy door. It was locked, but there was movement behind it. Diana caught up while I was standing to one side, trying my skeletons on the lock for size. No. No, don't go in there. I lied to you, Mr. Regan. My husband's not out of town. No? Stand back, baby. I want to work on this lock. No, you mustn't go in there. My my husband's desperate. He'll kill you. You figure one murder on his hands is enough, is that it? Yes, yes. A tough lock to make. So then I guess it was your husband the second tea place was set for when I came in. Yes, of course. Yeah. And was he the one the dog barked at? Yes, yes. You know, that's a careful watchdog you've got. To bark at its own master like that. Well, the dog is... Sure, sure, I know. You know, Diana, this key's going to work. No, don't go in there. He'll shoot you. I don't think so. I think it was his gun you tried to use on me a minute ago. All right, Drake, get your hands up over your head. Reckon I better do just what you say, Mr. Regan. You passed on your gun to Diana when she slipped out to see you a couple of minutes ago. You wanted her to get rid of me one way or another before I saw you. Saw you alive when you're supposed to be dead. Okay, Drake, I got the gun now. You got no choice but to do what I say. You're right about that, Mr. Regan. 
I know when I'm brief. I'll do whatever you tell me. That was it. The guy in the acid wasn't Arthur Drake at all. It was the guy known as Biloxi. Drake shot him, hid the body. Then today, Drake staged a disappearance. Before he left, while Mirabelle was sleeping, he put the body in the vat of acid. He figured it would be found, and with the condition it would be in, there'd be no way to tell it wasn't him. He'd be declared legally dead, and under a new name, begin life all over with Diana somewhere. I phoned Sanducci at Homicide, turned Arthur Drake over, and started out to find the lion. Jeffrey! Lion, what are you doing at home? Why aren't you at the office? Uh, Jeffrey, come back tomorrow. I'm very busy. Busy? Lion, I wrapped up the Arthur Drake murder. They're letting Mirabelle Drake go. Hmm? No, well, good work, my boy. Well, why don't you answer your phone? And I've been phoning the office trying to tell you that the case is closed. Well, I may be in the office tomorrow. Maybe? Yes, you can tell me all about the case then. Lion, don't you even want to know who did the murder? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course I do. Who did it? Arthur Drake. Yes, interesting. So that was it. So Arthur Drake murdered Arthur Drake! Jeffrey, that's impossible. Well, it was your detective work that clinched it, Lion. You don't say so. I do. The worm equipment lion. Huh? You found out from the agricultural extension people what it takes to raise them. Yes. No tub of acid was included. So that vat of acid Drake had at his place didn't have anything to do with worm breeding. It was for the disposal of the husband of the woman Drake was in love with. The guy who used the phony name of Myron Biloxi. I see. Imagine all this from my detective work with the agricultural extension people. Sure, lion. <laughs> you know, Jeffrey, I'm glad Drake was a criminal. Yeah? It reassures me. I'd already found out he was a very poor businessman. He wasn't swindled at all. About the worms, I mean. No, lad? No, no. I was talking with the agricultural extension people, you see. Jeffrey, I, I wonder if you have any conception of the fantastic financial possibilities. What? Yeah, what's that, Jeffrey? Oh, nothing, man. Uh, go on. Yes. Well, hey, come over here, Jeffrey. I was just fixing up these vegetable lug boxes here, you see. I see. Do you know, Jeffrey, 500 worms, $5 worth at one cent a worm, you see, will produce, still at a value of one cent for each worm, 40,000 worms in the 10th month, 110,000 worms in the 11th month, and in the 12th month alone, 522,000. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Aran. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time, Bob Stevenson speaking, and inviting you to be with us again for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. <laughs>